This video is sponsored by Longevity Technology. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to talk all about NAD plus metabolism, how NAD plus is generated within cells, how NAD plus is consumed, and how NAD plus is important to a variety of different cellular processes within a cell, and how the decline in NAD plus during aging can be linked to the different hallmarks of aging. And then lastly, we'll look at different ways of being able to rejuvenate the levels of NAD plus either through supplementation, through inhibiting enzymes that degrade NAD+, or by activating enzymes that help to generate NAD+, within a cell, and evaluate whether at further questions and what clinical trials are currently in progress. So the best place to start is with NAD itself. So NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and it is one of the most abundant molecules in the human body. It is important not only as a coenzyme for different redox reactions and for energy metabolism, but also as an essential cofactor for different enzymes, notably the sirtuin family and poly-ADP ribose polymerases, known as PARPs, that are important in DNA repair. But it is thought that there are more than 300 enzymes relying on NAD plus for their activity. So I think we can say that NAD plus is pretty important. However, NAD plus levels have been shown to decline as we age, when there's high amounts of DNA damage, which is partly due to the activation of these PARP enzymes and due to sirtuin activity, and also during alcohol metabolism. And so for these different reasons, there's a lot of interest at the moment in trying to restore NAD plus levels to alleviate some of the symptoms associated with NAD plus decline. But before we go into some of these methods, we really need to understand NAD metabolism and how it works. Otherwise, what I say could just sound like a load of gibberish. So in my opinion, the best way to understand it is to understand why NAD plus is called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotides. And that can be seen by looking at its structure, where I've indicated different groups of the compounds and where the name comes from. So the first part, nicotinamide, comes from the fact that it has this nicotinamide group attached to a ribose molecule. The second ribose molecule in NAD plus is attached to an adenosine group, hence the nicotinamide adenine aspects of the name. And then the last part, dinucleotide, refers to the fact that these two ribose molecules are attached through two phosphates, and this is similar to the backbone of nucleic acids. And so each nucleic acid is otherwise referred to as a nucleotide, and so you've got a dinucleotide present. And so the reason I went into so much detail here isn't because I love biochemistry, which I obviously do, but because it helps us to understand how NAD plus is generated and then consumed within a cell. And so it's thought that there are three different pathways within a cell that can generate NAD+. And these three pathways are nicely summarised in this figure from a recent review article on NAD plus metabolism, which was a good source of information for this video. And so on the far left, you can see that there's the de novo pathway to NAD plus formation that starts from tryptophan, tryptophan being an amino acid. As you can see, there's quite a few steps that take tryptophan through to NAD plus, and for these reasons, some of the enzymes involved in these steps aren't expressed in all cell types. And so it's thought that this de novo pathway is mainly occurring only in the liver. The second pathway to NAD plus is from vitamin precursors known as nicotinic acid, or you might know it as niacin. And this gets converted to NAD plus via the Prius handler pathway. And the last method is the so-called salvage pathway, which generates NAD plus from nicotinamide, NAM. So if we go back to the biochemical structure of NAD plus that I showed you earlier, nicotinamide is just this moiety group at the end that I've indicated. And the reason it's called the salvage pathway is because when NAD plus is consumed by different enzymes within the body, such as sirtuins and PARPs, one of the products is nicotinamide. And so nicotinamides can be converted back into NAD+, and therefore effectively rescue the NAD plus levels. The way it's converted back is by going through an intermediate known as NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. So let's take a look at that structure. So as before, nicotinamide refers to the fact that NMN contains the nicotinamide group. And then this time it's known as a mononucleotide because unlike NAD+, which is a dinucleotide, NMN has one ribose and one phosphate. And our understanding of the salvage pathway was further added to in 2004 when Charles Brenner discovered nicotinamide ribosides, which can be converted into NMN, and NMN, as I just said, can be converted into NAD+. And this becomes clearer when we look at the structures again. So NR, nicotinamide ribosides, has just nicotinamides and ribose. And so to get from NR to NMN, it needs to be phosphorylated. 
And so there are kinases that have been identified that have shown that NR can be converted into NMN. Now, I feel like I've gone into quite a bit of detail here to really explain to you how NAD plus can be generated within a cell. But the reason I have is because we'll come back to it later when we try to discuss different methods and approaches to rejuvenating NAD plus levels. But firstly, we need to understand why do NAD plus levels decline? Well, I've already mentioned two NAD plus consuming enzymes, sirtuins and PARPs. But NAD plus can also be consumed by two enzymes, CD38 and CD157. And you can see it very clearly in this figure that these enzymes are found at the cellular membrane and they're called ectoenzymes because they have activity outside of the cell. And so whilst NAD consumption may seem like a bad thing because you're decreasing NAD plus levels, these different sets of enzymes require NAD plus to carry out their function. So in the case of sirtuins, their function is to deacetylate different proteins that is important for activating different stress resistance pathways within a cell, such as autophagy. And with the PARPs, they use NAD plus to drive reactions that can help repair DNA damage. Again, something that's pretty important. However, the function of CD38 and, well, even more so CD157 are not currently characterised as well. However, what seems to be the case is that both CD38 and CD157 are upregulated in ageing tissues. And as I mentioned in a previous video, it seems that upregulation of CD38 is a major culprit for the decline in NAD plus levels that occurs during ageing. And the interesting thing with this study was the increase in expression of CD38, in this case on macrophages, a form of immune cells, seemed to be occurring due to the secretion of inflammatory factors by senescent cells in the neighbouring visceral fat and liver. And so it seems like NAD plus decline could be linking the different hallmarks of ageing together. And well, we'd probably be here all day and longer if I went through all of the studies that have shown links between NAD plus metabolism and the different hallmarks of ageing. But just to show a few, NAD plus decline has been associated with metabolic dysfunction and in a mouse model whereby they inhibited CD38. This enzyme I just told you about that consumes NAD+, they found that the mice were protected from obesity, have increased metabolic rates and have relatively normal glucose metabolism during high fat diets and during ageing. Moreover, CD38 expression increases in the course of Alzheimer's disease progression and the Alzheimer's disease mouse model lacking CD38 resulted in elevated NAD plus levels in their brains and they also showed a milder disease phenotype. And so whilst I've specifically included two examples that include CD38, CD38 is emerging as a key enzyme involved in inflammaging and senescence, which could be also helping to link NAD plus metabolism and its decline with all of the different hallmarks of aging. In particular, because we know that there are senescent cells in the brain and that in itself has been linked to Alzheimer's disease. So it's all a matter of trying to put the puzzle pieces together. But the more important question is, if we know that this is the case and NAD plus is really important, what strategies are there to increase NAD plus levels? Well, if we consider the analogy whereby water is NAD plus, then there are three main ways in which you can maintain the water levels in a sink. Firstly, it's to prevent any leakages and loss of water. In this case, representing the different enzymes that consume NAD plus for example, CD38. Then there's the fact that you want to increase the supply of water. That can come from precursors to NAD+. And then the third strategy is to open up the faucet to allow the flow of water to be stronger. And this could come by activating different enzymes involved in the metabolism and generation of NAD+. Or as I like to think of it, the make, break or take strategies to prevent NAD plus decline. So let's start with the taking strategies ways of supplementing NAD plus levels, since that's where we have majority of information at the moment. One option would be to supplement with nicotinamide, since it can be converted back to NAD plus by the salvage pathway. However, at the moment, the consensus seems to be that at high levels, nicotinamide seems to be acting as a feedback inhibitor of NAD plus dependent enzymes, including PARPs and sirtuins. An alternative idea is to use niacin, which is actually already commonly found in multivitamins. However, there seems to be some concerns over niacin in terms of high doses, in particular because it can cause flushing of the skin. So instead, NMN and NR have also been investigated in their ability to increase NAD plus levels. 
In addition to the many promising results from preclinical studies in different model organisms using NMN and NR, as you can see here in screenshots taken from this review article, NMN and NR administration seems to be safe and can efficiently increase NAD plus levels in healthy volunteers. There have been more phase 1 clinical trials using NR as opposed to NMN, but at the moment there are trials being conducted using both precursors, separately I should add, and looking at different aspects. For example, I've highlighted one of the nicotinamide riboside trials, where they are planning to assess the cognitive performance in patients with mild cognitive impairment, and so data from that will be particularly interesting. However, what would be most interesting is one to get long-term safety trials to see the impact of taking these dietary supplements, along with the proper dose, treatment period, and consideration of the diversity of participants, as this will better help with translation of these therapies. Now, what's commonly asked is what's better to take, NMN or NR, and at the moment, without any direct comparisons, it is pretty much impossible to say. But there's a couple of interesting points that are worth mentioning. The first one revolves around bioavailability and the second one revolves around metabolism. Now, if we draw a big box around the dietary supplementation of NMN or NR and the outcomes that we see in these either clinical studies or in mouse models, at the moment we can probably just put in a big fat question mark because it is still being investigated. However, due to advances in being able to track NAD precursors by using isotopic labels, what is known as that intravenous administration of NR or NMN delivers intact molecules to multiple tissues. However, if it's taken orally, they seem to be metabolised to nicotinamide in the liver. Moreover, in this 2016 study, they showed that when nicotinamide riboside was taken by human patients, it increased the levels of NAAD, which is one of the components of the Prius handler pathway, whereby you generate NAD plus from niacin. And so that doesn't quite make sense, given that this is a different pathway to the one in which NR contributes to. And so a recent preprint has come out that has tried to address why this might be the case. And it seems like the situation is just even more complicated, because now it seems that the gut microbiome is also playing a role and can metabolise NMN into nicotinamide. So the plot just thickens, and this could be thickened even further if I told you that all of our gut microbiomes do differ in different ways, and therefore how different people respond to the supplementation of NR or NMN could very much differ. And so basically there's a lot of investigation still to be done. But hopefully some of these clinical trials will provide a bit more information. And it's also worth pointing out that along with NR and NMN, there's the recently identified NRH, a reduced form of and, are. and this appears to be more stable and more potent in terms of increasing NAD plus levels and has been described by Charles Brenner as an interesting molecule. However, it's very scarce in terms of any data at the moment, but I'll be sure to keep you updated when I find out more. But this is not the only strategy. A more recent area of development are targeting NAD plus degrading enzymes such as CD38 and CD157. And so I mentioned earlier some of the benefits in terms of the mouse models when either CD38 was inhibited or the gene encoding CD38 was knocked out. And so several inhibitors of CD38 either already exist or are in development. One that already exists is apigenin, which is a naturally occurring flavonoid that enhances NAD plus levels in human cells and mouse liver tissue and has been shown to improve glucose and lipid homeostasis in mouse models of obesity. Another flavonoid is luteolinidin, that again shows activity as a CD38 inhibitor. However, both of these are very much under-investigated at the moment, and are not as advanced in our knowledge as NAD precursors. And then the last strategy is to increase NAD plus production by activating the enzymes involved in its biosynthesis. One of these enzymes is NAMPT, which is converting nicotinamides into NMN. I've highlighted two compounds that are thought are able to activate this enzyme in this table here. However, it's important to point out that again, the research in this area is still pretty young and it's not necessarily clear if these molecules have off-target effects and are also influencing other pathways within a cell. And so all in all, there's a lot of open questions. Firstly, whether or not there are any long-term consequences to boosting NAD plus levels whether any of these supplements have specificity for different tissues, in particular due to the fact that the degradation of NMN and NR now seems to be very complicated. And then looking more specifically at what is the most effective therapeutic dose and could they be used for different age-associated diseases? 
Then there's the idea of whether or not they could be used in combination or whether these approaches to inhibit NAD plus consuming enzymes are going to be more superior. Again, it's just too early to know. And then the other thing that I always find fascinating is the fact that NAD plus levels fluctuate during the day because it is under regulation as well as influencing the circadian rhythm. And so understanding the chronopharmacodynamics and kinetics of these different strategies is also something that I would find interesting because maybe there are certain times of day that are more effective than others. But all in all, it seems very promising. So with that, I would like to say thank you to this video sponsor, Longevity Technology, for which I'm very grateful. Longevity Technology deliver high quality daily news and insights in research, investments and technologies that extend health span and lifespan. Find the link to their website in the description. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. And with that, thanks for listening.